This is the story of Omega Air Refueling Services Flight 70. Usually when I start a video, I tell you about the plane that was flying, the operator, the origin airport, the destination airport, and all that stuff. But today it's a bit different. Today we have to talk about Omega Air Refueling Services first, because that's an interesting conversation all on its own. Omega Air Refueling Services is a private operator that operates air tankers exclusively. You have private airlines that carry passengers and cargo, and like that, Omega Air Refueling Services carries fuel. So if you need your strike fighters refueled and you don't have your own air tankers on hand, you call these guys. They'll launch their planes, fuel yours up, and land back. That's their business model. By their website, they've done about 5,000 missions and they've delivered about 180 million pounds or about 81 million kilograms of fuel, which is a lot. They support a whole host of clients from the US Navy to the Marine Corps to the Australian, British and Canadian Air Forces. Not bad at all. They operate the KC-707 and the KDC-10. Keep in mind, that's the KC-707 and not the KC-135. The KC-135 is a brother to the 707, but it was designed from the ground up to be a tanker, whereas the KC-707, the ones that Omega flies, were passenger planes a long time ago, which got converted into tankers. I did not know that there existed a private air tanker operator. I guess you learn something new every day. If you do know any others, do let me know down in the comments below. On the 18th of May 2011 at about 5.23 p.m. PDT, an Omega Air Refueling Services 707 with the tail number November 707 Alpha Romeo was taxiing out onto runway 21 of Point Magoo Naval Air Station, California. Their mission today was to refuel FA-18s off in the offshore warning area airspace. The pilots, a captain, a co-pilot, and a flight engineer were all very experienced. The wind was coming in from 280 degrees and was at 24 knots and gusting to 34 knots. The pilots looked out the cockpit window and at the windsock flapping in the wind. All looked good. The pilots crunched the numbers and they came up with 141 knots for their V1 speed and 147 knots for the speed at which they had to rotate. If something goes wrong after V1, you have to get your bird in the air because there just isn't enough runway for you to safely stop on. The pilots being cautious added 5 knots to their rotate speed to compensate for the gusting winds. The pilots talked about the power settings for takeoff. The co-pilot was the pilot monitoring and he advised the captain about advancing the throttle slowly to avoid a power surge. The controller gave them the all clear and flight 70 was given clearance to take off. They were asked to turn to 160 degrees when airborne. The captain advanced the throttles and he pushed the yoke down and applied some ailerons to compensate for the crosswind. The plane accelerated and it picked up speed as it went down the runway. They hit their rotate speed and the captain gently lifted the plane into the air, aiming to pitch the plane up by 11 degrees. The plane gained about 20 feet of altitude and was about 7,000 feet down the runway when all three crew members heard a loud thud and the throttle for engine number two, the inboard engine on the left side, automatically went to idle. The captain applies right rudder and right aileron to level the wings, but despite his best efforts, the plane continued to drift left. The captain knew that his bird was crippled and that she was in no state to climb out. This is when he decided to, quote, put it back on the ground. The captain was going to ditch a 707, and not just any 707, a 707 that was fully fueled and which had enough fuel to fully fuel a couple of F-18 fighter jets. Engines 1, 3, and 4 were at max power, but the plane was descending. The captain lowered the nose and he leveled the wings, and the plane touched back down on the runway. Hard. The plane bounced a few times and it veered off the runway. It was still pretty fast and the plane cut across a taxiway and then it departed the airport entirely. The plane came to rest in a marshy area near the runway, but the crew wasn't out of danger yet. They saw flames in the cabin and they evacuated through the left 
forward entrance as the cockpit windows were blocked. I'll link a news report about the crash below. You can see what happened to the plane in that. Thankfully, the crew made it out alive and no one was injured on the ground. Cell phone videos and eyewitnesses on the ground had seen what had happened to Omega Flight 70. Engine number two had come off as the plane lifted off. The engine traveled up and over the left wing. As engine number two detached, the inlet cowling of engine number one fell away. The cowling is the outer bit of the jet engine. The turbine sits recessed inside the jet inlet cowling, the cover of the jet engine, if you will. Without the cowling, engine number one was no longer aerodynamic and was generating huge amounts of drag. According to Pratt & Whitney, the engine generated, quote, less than zero thrust output, end quote. It's obvious why the captain struggled to control the plane. The left wing was generating no thrust and the right wing was at max thrust, which caused the plane to bank left. The plane that they had been flying was manufactured in 1969 and at the time of the accident, it had more than 47,000 hours of flying under its belt. Since it's obvious that the engine coming off contributed greatly to the crash, let's look at how a 707 engine was anchored to the wing. The engine is mounted to the bottom of the wing in four distinct places. We have an upper connection and a lower connection. The upper connection consists of the overwing support fitting and the front spar fitting. The lower connection consists of the lower spar fitting and the diagonal brace. And in the middle, you have about two mid spars. If you're an aviation maintenance tech, I'd love to hear what you have to say about mounting engines to the wing. Because I honestly don't know a whole lot. In its most basic form, the upper connections, the lower connections, and the mid spars route the loads from the engine to the wing. A diagonal brace is used to handle drag-induced loads on the engine, so all the drag forces are transferred through the diagonal brace into the wing. If you're interested in learning how an engine is mounted to the wing, I recommend reading the final report on LL Flight 1862. It goes into a lot of detail, and that's what I used for this video. Looking back into the history of the airplane, they find airworthiness directives and Boeing service bulletins pertaining to the engine. Service bulletin number 707-3183 called for the visual inspection of the mid spars in 1977. The service bulletins also called for repetitive visual inspections of the mid spars at frequent intervals. Moreover, the bulletins also called for the eventual replacement of the mid spars with a more robust model. But why was all this attention on the mid spars? Boeing had recorded 45 incidents of mid spar cracking. This was not an isolated issue. A Nigerian airplane had cracking issues which led to an engine falling off the plane which forced the crew to make an emergency landing. The same thing happened on a Colombian airplane. The mid spars, the crucial metal bits that connected the engines to the wing, was prone to corrosion. Omega told the investigators that they had conducted a visual inspection of the engine mid spars in 1996, shortly after the plane had been converted into a tanker. Omega continued to inspect the mid spars till 2003 when they discovered that a previous owner had complied with the service bulletins and the airworthiness directives in 1983 and so Omega stopped visually inspecting the engine mounts on the 707. As far as they were concerned, the problem was fixed. Why waste time looking for an issue that had already been fixed? The investigators decided to run a few metallurgical tests on the engine mid spars to see if the issue had been fixed. The mechanism that held engines 1 and 2 to the wing was tested in a lab. It proved that the parts of the pylon assembly of engines 1 and 2 failed in an overload event, as in they were subjected to forces that they were not designed to handle. Except for two parts, the mid spars on engine number 2 they failed due to fatigue. The mid spars had not been replaced. The document that said that the parts had been replaced was a lie. The previous owner had not done the maintenance that they said that they did. 
the fractured area was covered with corrosion, meaning that it had been exposed to the atmosphere for a significant amount of time. At this point, we have a clear idea of what happened. As the plane lifted off, the stress of takeoff was too much, and the crack in the midspar grew to a critical length. The midspar in the upper corner failed, and with it, the engine was ripped off its mounts. The falling engine took out engine number one. Calculations later showed that there was no way that the plane would have been able to climb with two engines and one engine generating huge amounts of drag. The captain was right to put the plane back onto the runway. Had Omega Airlines continued to inspect the mid spars like they used to pre-2003, they would have caught the issue and they would have carried out the necessary fixes. A record that was falsified in 1983 prevented the detection of a corroding part in a pylon assembly. It was just a matter of time before the midspar failed, and it's a miracle that the midspar lasted as long as it did. This accident would have been a lot worse had the plane crashed into a residential neighborhood. The quick thinking of the captain meant that the crew of Omega Airlines Flight 70 was able to walk away from a disaster that could have been fatal. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. A big thank you to Traveler, Toilu, and Planes Weekly for letting me use their amazing footage on my video. Stay safe, wash your hands, and I'll catch you guys next time.